The Telemanni people were not alone in the universe. At first, it was just a whisper of radio signals. Too regular to ignore, but too brief to really place credence in. Then came another. Then another. Then a constant stream. Once the scientists realised it was more than a fluke, it took all of two seconds to point a hypercom generator at the planet of origin and send a signal. As ecstatic as the Talamani had been to receive even the distant hints at intelligent life off of their own small blue moon, they were even more so to receive a return hypercom signal. At first it was nothing but unintelligible hash, the signal formats too different to read. There was intelligence behind the signal, but no sure meaning. So they started from the ground up, with a short burst of mathematical sequences. They got the completed set, with another from the other people for them to complete. Within a single day, it was solved and sent, winging across the void with another set of Telemanni design, more complex than the last. For dozens of revolutions, the scientists of two worlds laboured so that they may one day talk in more than simple numbers and notation. They failed. Every attempt to bridge the gap in cognition between the two people was foiled by some twist. Images were too complex, the computers unable to comprehend the radically different architecture of the others. Words were utterly unintelligible. Letters are images, after all. Pictograms couldn't be deciphered, and even if they could, there would be no guarantee of a common frame of reference. The common interactions of the universe, gravity, electromagnetism, radioactivity, could be used, perhaps as metaphors, but there was no sure way to know if the others had interpreted it properly. But as always, both peoples had numbers, math and the concept of space. Everything seemed to mark a place and a time. It took a few revolutions, but eventually the Telemanni managed to impress upon the others a desire to send a meeting in a certain place at a certain time. Or at least they thought they did. They could not be sure. They would send a ship anyways. If the messages had not been interpreted, that would be fine. There would be no loss and both peoples would simply resume their attempts to translate each other's messages. If the others did send a representative though, the reward would be immeasurable. A whole new civilization, with new science, new perspectives, and maybe, as some dare to hope, other contacts among the stars. Real space transition in three, two, one. The bridge windows clear into a bright starscape as the diplomatic cruiser Psyla slides into position with barely a whisper of wasted radiation. Status report, Captain Claris calls over the wine of deploying radiators as the Psyla began dumping the waste heat it had accumulated over the long slip space journey. All departments report nominal functioning of ship systems Engineering clears for manoeuvring. Calls out Nekamre, the internal officer. Slit space eddies indicate that we have arrived 84 ticks ahead of indicated time, reports the navigation officer. Hold position. Internal, ensure that the diplomatic team is ready for contact. Clarence's wings shuffle and his chest feathers flush a happy orange as he briefly contemplates being the officer, presiding over the first meeting between two completely separate intelligent species. Diplomatic team reports full readiness. All members. The science external officer cuts off the internal officer's report. Energy surge bearing 488 by 673. Gamma radiation. Raise shields. Any chance this can be an anomaly? Cleric snaps as he snaps himself out of his fantasies at first contact. His ship is in danger. This was in no place for something like that. Scans indicate no proximate anomalies. Shields raised. Clarex watches as a shimmering film of blue energy slides over the Silar, sparking as it shunts aside the gamma energy, glowing brighter as the energy surges ever higher. Radiation alarms began to wail as the energy worms its way through the shield, battering at the fragile hull of the Silar. Energy increases plateauing. Shields are keeping radiation below lethal. Contact! The external combat officer this time, bearing 488 by 673. Large contact. One window snaps to display the ship that had just appeared in what was an incomprehensible maelstrom of energy. Claris can't prevent a small gasp from escaping his beak. An immense iron construct, vaguely seed-shaped, floats placidly inside a deadly vortex of radiation. Readouts and overlays blink into existence around it, giving it scale. It's the size of a small island, and nearly solid armour. It's a warship. Radiation decreasing, returning to safe levels. 
the external science officer calls out, but Clarix is barely listening. Have we been so naive? Were we so eager to converse with some other soul in the universe that we overlooked something? Did we offend them? Contact is not manoeuvring. Radiation is decreasing to baseline. Communication is now possible. We may have just doomed everyone. If this is how they build warships, we have no chance of standing against them. Captain? Captain! The internal officer shakes him out of his reverie. Yes, officer. Diplomatic team is reporting readiness. They are... eager, sir. Did none of them see it? Contact is sending a signal. This is it. The final threats. Only it wasn't. It was nothing more than an enthalpy equation describing the formation of sodium chloride. An incomplete one. Do they want a response? Why the song and dance of sending a warship but not attacking us immediately? Captain, do you want to send a response? What if it's not a warship? They came in a massive flash of radiation. That level of armor would certainly be necessary to withstand that. Captain? No. Yes. Clarence contemplates the decision for only a moment longer. They were not making any hostile moves, and nothing existed to be gained by fleeing. Send the complete signal. Contact the diplomatic team. Initiate contact. If I'm wrong, their blood will be on my hands. Ambassador Kaquila floats in freefall, halfway between the vast iron construct of the other people and his own comparatively tiny ship, trying to keep his thrilling heart in check. The beam before him is strikingly similar to his own. One head, albeit a round one, the helmet of the figure made no allowances for a beak. Two arms, ending in five blunt fingers instead of his four clawed ones. Two legs with similarly structured boots. No wings at all. It's dressed in a white reflective suit with some sort of sleek pack on its back, which occasionally emits a white burst of gas to keep it centered, much the same as his own Eva pack. Hesitantly, or so it seems, it raises one of its arms, extending all five of its fingers. The pack on its back pulses in a complicated sequence to compensate for the motion. Hesitantly, Tequila raises his own, reaching out and not quite touching. Whatever being was in the other suit seemed to come to a decision, reaching out further, but it still seems hesitant as his hand hovers over his. Kakila is acutely aware of every single camera of the Silar pointed at him, acutely aware of the eyes of the Telemani people counting at him not to screw up. They don't stop him, as he finally takes that last step, wrapping his own fingers around those of the other person. First contact. For real this time. The alien's hand tightens around Kakila's own, sending a brief twinge of discomfort up his arm, swiftly overridden by the irrepressible joy of finally, finally reaching out and touching something wholly alien, something built by another civilization with his own hand. He can't help but look at the leviathan hovering behind the other person. It was just so large. Even though the Sila was just a speck in the distance, the gunmetal grey hull of the other craft was still discernible. Slowly and carefully, Kakila moves to extricate himself, loosing his grip by degrees. The other being seems to understand, moving his hands so that they both slide apart easily. Gently, Kakila floats away, pulsing lightly on jets of gas emitted from the edges of his outstretched wings. The other being also begins to maneuver, jetting away and opening up the distance so that they are no longer able to touch. In a sudden motion, the alien halts his flight, and then brings its hand up to a protrusion on his shoulder yanking sharply. Kakila can't contain his gasp. Did he just breach his own suit? But no, there's no plume of escaping gas or flailing from a dying being. Instead, the alien simply examines the chunk of suit with the practiced efficiency of an expert, verifying the functionality of their equipment. Seeming satisfied, it does something to the side of the flat chunk of material, and one face of it lights up with swirling colors before going out completely. The being taps the surface with one of its blunt fingers, before turning the solid black screen towards Kakila, then waiting, motionless. Am I supposed to see something? Is this another greeting? Kakila elects to wait, simply watching the other being. After several seconds, the being flips the screen so that it is facing it, examining it closely. After manipulating it for several seconds more, there's the chirp of a hypercom signal, incoming from the other alien. The signal is nothing special, a range of electromagnetic frequencies with a certain spectrum highlighted by boosting their amplitude in the representation. Do they want me to shine it back at them? It's a bit lower than the visual spectrum, but 
There's nothing special about it. Its thoughts are cut off by another signal from the alien. This one is a repeat of the previous section of electromagnetism, but this time there's another system attached to it, one detailing the transformation of the light into ionic signals by some indecipherable mechanism. I don't... what? The signal from the alien simply loops. Light to electrical signals? What could that... oh! The meaning crashes down on him all at once. Of course, sight. They're telling me what spectrum of light they used to see. Why would they see the same light we do? They evolved in a completely different place. With a careful movement of his eyes, Kakila brings up the scanner and examines the glowing surface of the device. Spectrum lies split off in his heart. Completely solid or no light in most spectrums, but variation in the spectrum indicated in the broadcast. With a twitch, Kakila adjusts his heart, flickering the light into the visual spectrum. Pictograms. Ones that could never be translated any other way than just looking at it. Most prominently, two figures, one with an arm upraised. In general proportions, they exactly match the figure in front of Kakila. They look odd. No fur except for a small patch on the top of his head, or feathers, with sharply defined muscles and a flat face without a beak. That must be what they look like under the suit. But the alien makes no additional moves, simply making an odd motion with his helmeted head before it manipulates the tablet again. When it faces Kakila again, the graphic has changed, displaying a simplified star map. The hypercom signal also shifts, cutting off mid-packet. Now it displays astrological data. Each stream is preceded by a star on the map pulsing before a stream of equations are broadcast, including luminosity, spectral lines and temperature, among other things. One star in the centre of the map pulses, then the broadcast follows, but this one's different. In the heading of the broadcast, there's a notation that indicates originality, the start of a wave rippling outwards. In the actual broadcast, the data is more accurate. The error bar is almost non-existent. Is this a home star? It must be. The overall sum of the presentation was easy to grasp. This is what we look like. This is where we came from. Kakila waits patiently for the broadcast to terminate. When the last star pulses, the alien deactivates the tablet, the screen fading to black before they clip it to their suit. The implication was obvious. Your turn. Kakila moves for the first time in several minutes, bringing his arms to his sides as the hollow projectors at the tip of his wings warm up, sending an electric tingle through his body. Most of light collect in the space between the two aliens, eventually coalescing into the shape of a naked telemani, arms and wings outstretched. The feather tone is a pure white, and the emotion feathers are left blank, neutral grey. The other jerks. If it had been standing on solid ground, it would have jumped. Kakila can't stop his chest plumage from shifting to an amused purple, even if it was covered by his suit. The Telemani figure animates, running, jumping, and finally taking flight over a simple line representing the ground. A broadcast overlaying the animation details gravity, velocity, air pressure, and every conceivable biological metric that could be translated into something objectively understandable. This is what we look like. This is what we can do. The alien patiently waits for the broadcast to conclude, before unclipping his tablet again. Kakila feels momentarily unbalanced. He hadn't expected a second round of presentation, hadn't prepared anything else. But leaving now would do nothing but strain an already delicate situation. Nobody wanted to be remembered for offending aliens during first contact. This time the graphic is of a star system. Planets whirl around a central star in time lapse. Overlaid with most major bodies was an unfamiliar symbol that didn't match any known scientific notation. Most of them were multicoloured or included similar shapes. Almost like nest heraldry. Are they in a time of division? Suddenly, there's a disturbance overlaid with the image. With a start, Kakila recognises the waveform. It was the original hypercom signal the scientists had sent to the radio anomaly. One by one, the heraldries of the planets begin to shift. They become uniform, switching to a single symbol that incorporated elements from all the others. Definitely a time of division that we pull them out of. In the space between planets, something is highlighted. Not a shape, but a visible representation of something. A series of spectral lines. They match the ones with the hull of the Iron Behemoth. They built a ship specifically for this meeting? Do they not have diplomatic ships on hand, even if coming out of a period of division? The spectral lines vanish in a burst of something else. Radiation of the same variety that had almost fired the silo on the way in. The presentation ends. 
the tablet screen going dark. Hurriedly, Kakili begins to program a simulation, a simple one where a few objects would stay together as a whole, breaking apart every so often, then come back together. A crude metaphor for the cycles of unity, followed by brief periods of division and discord, but an accurate one. The hologram projector lights up again, displaying the simulation as a visual representation. Kakila adds overlays to the objects. When together as a whole, he represents them with the combined symbol at the end of the alien simulation. When they fly apart, the overlays are replaced with a random selection of the displayed heraldries. In a final touch, he has a request at the end or a time variable before the simulation loops. How long was your time of division? The alien regards the simulation. For a moment, Kakila isn't sure if they grasp it. Then they send a single burst of code. Infinity. Impossible. Peoples divided always fell, to nature or some other more united power. The obvious end result was a single global, then system-wide, then interstellar hegemony. Periods of discord did happen, true, but they were always brief, with one power seizing control quickly. Every social theory stated this as immutable. To have a race whose entire history was a single point of division would be impossible. They would have either united or been driven extinct. For a moment, Kakila's mind races down this pathway of thought before he comes to another realisation. They must have had plenty of opportunities to unite before. They always refused. If their species is old enough to reach space, this instinct must be a biological imperative. So what convinced them to break with thousands of years of tradition, precedent and experience? The chance to meet someone else. The chance to meet new friends. The chance to meet us.